I'm Gary Birch, retired University of Georgia professor and founding director of the Center for International Trade and Security. I'm here today, November 19, 2018, with Dr. Igor Kripanov, recently retired from the University of Georgia and the Center for International Trade and Security. We sometimes say uh, SITS for the Center, CITS standing for the Center for International Trade and Security. Igor and I will be talking today about his life and work, starting in Russia, coming to the United Nations and Washington, D.C., to Athens, Georgia, and uh, around the world. Good morning, Igor. Uh, I'd like to begin by asking you to tell us something about your childhood growing up in Russia. Uh, thank you, Gary, for inviting me for this interview. Uh, I think I should start with the, my early years. Uh, when was my first introduction to the international affairs, uh, policies, and so on? Because my father was uh, head of the Soviet diplomatic uh, mission in South Africa, and I was a member of the family, staying with my mother and father until the age of seven. Just a, a brief mention of a very interesting episode that happened at that time. Uh, I said my father was head of the diplomatic mission, and at some point in year 1951 or 52, he was approached by a group of uh, South African intellectuals, and they said, uh, we have high respect for Comrade Stalin for his victory uh, during the Second World War, and we want to give him a gift, which is a symbol of his courage. And that was a small lion cub. Uh, that was quite an embarrassment to the whole uh, personnel, you know, uh, of the diplomatic mission because they never had any instructions, you know, how to handle, you know, lions. So being a, a, a professional diplomat, my father sent a cable, what I'm supposed to do, accept, reject, uh, negotiate. Uh, and then, you know, a uh, response came directly from Kremlin. Stalin agreed to accept this gift. So half the personnel at the embassy, uh, at the mission, you know, were just trying to make travel arrangements for a two-year-old cub. And for a month, uh, the lion by the name Chaka <clears throat> lived in our house, and I was in charge of walking, you know, that lion. Uh, when we returned later, three years later, uh, we found uh, the lion in the Moscow Zoo in a very lavishly decorated cage because, you know, Stalin reputation, you know, as a former leader. That was after 53 when Stalin died. But then came the 20th Congress under Khrushchev, uh, the new Soviet leader, who criticized uh, and exposed Stalin, you know, for his atrocities during many years. So anything associated with uh, Stalin was banished, uh, removed, and poor Lion was sent to Siberia. Mm -hmm. And uh, my father told me that several months later, because you know people at the small zoo in Siberia never had the lions, <clears throat> the lion simply died. So it's a sad story. And uh, I thought after retirement, I can uh, really write a story telling that people and animals should not pay a high price for the mistakes of their leaders. But, you know, maybe lack of talent, shortness of time, and other considerations still prevented me from fulfilling this agenda. Well, your education has been important to uh, your agenda and your many contributions. Tell us a little bit about uh, your education starting in Russia. Uh, <clears throat> I graduated from a regular high school, nothing special. Uh, I applied for a linguistic university to become a professional uh, interpreter in uh, English and French and study linguistics. 
Uh, at that time, you know, the Soviet Union was opening up to the West, and <clears throat> the country really needed people with a good command of English who can act as professional translators and interpreters. And that was a little bit fascinating to me, really, to see the world and uh, uh, know the languages. Uh, upon graduation from the Linguistic University, I applied for Moscow-based UN language training school uh, and became uh, and got a certificate to work for the United Nations as a simultaneous uh, uh, interpreter for Russia for English and French. So I was um, assigned a contract with the United Nations uh, in um, 1969 and then moved to New York with my family. And for a young person, you know, in 69, uh, to live in an uh, apartment in a, in a building, you know, with all the Americans and uh, certainly mixing up with all these people was really fun. So uh, I keep telling my students, you know, when I was teaching at UGA that if you really want to get a better outlook of the world, understand, you know, how the world is rotating, you know, how policies are shaped, apply for even a minor job, you know, at the United Nations. It will give you that perspective. Well, um, you've seen a lot. Uh, tell us a little bit more about uh, maybe your work at the United Nations and then certainly your professional work in the former Soviet Union. Well, interpretation is a really hard work, you know, to perform, you know, and uh, we work in different booths. Uh, since my mother tongue is Russian, you know, I was assigned to the Russian booth and I translated, you know, from English and French into Russian. Uh, but uh, the team is usually selected in a way so that all interpreters can know all the official languages. Because if I don't know, for example, Spanish, I switch to the English booth, which translates from Spanish into English, and I can translate from English into Russian. And there were many, certainly, jokes that I can share about uh, the experience of interpreters. Uh, I recall uh, being assigned to a small committee on sanctions on Rhodesia. So there was Rhodesia under sanctions because of the white rule uh, and so on, and the sanctions were imposed by the United Nations. And this committee was considering you know, different uh, requests from Rhodesia uh, to waive sanctions regarding any particular transaction or, or deal. And uh, the uh, person from, from Rhodesia uh, came uh, as a speaker and he requested a waiver uh, for 50 toys. Uh, they were MiG fighters 16, old Soviet fighters. But I missed the word toy. And I saw the Soviet representative dropping a pencil, you know, when he heard that the Society of Blind People, you know, in Rhodesia is requesting a waiver to sell somewhere in the world 50 MiG-16s. <laughs> uh, I realized, you know, my mistake, you know, immediately and then apologized, you know, to the Soviet representative and I think he, uh, he could recover his composure, you know. Hmm. Well, uh, an So interpreters can really make the change. Yeah. Uh, and I can imagine mm, what uh, pressurized environment that can sometimes be uh, dealing at the highest levels. I know that you uh, did some interpretation for Gorbachev and other Soviet leaders. Can you tell us about some of those experiences? I spent five years working for the United Nations, but when I moved back you know, to Moscow, uh, I was invited to work for the Ministry of Foreign Affairs. And it was really at the beginning of my uh, professional diplomatic career. Uh, I interpreted, you know, for top leaders, for uh, Brezhnev, for Kosygin, and other heads of the uh, 
uh, one of the top leaders of the uh, Soviet Union. Um, I remember, for example, being assigned to um, Indian Prime Minister Desai, who came to Moscow on an official uh, visit, driving around Moscow and telling Mr. Prime Minister, would you like to go to the Borodino Museum, which uh, uh, really depicted the battle during the Napoleon War uh, in Russia. He agreed and then, you know, driving uh, to the airport with Brezhnev and Kasigin, the top leaders, you know, uh, the prime minister said, I want to thank your interpreter. And I really shuddered, you know, <laughs> expecting probably the worst. And he said, he showed me the museum and uh, I want to, uh, the Soviet government to build a similar museum in India to commemorate one of the battles that we had uh, in our history. So Brezhnev, okay, you know, let's send uh, a message to our Minister of Culture immediately, collect people and send them to India. So I feel proud that I found jobs mm -hmm. for some, uh, you know, decorators, you know, historians, and other people who maybe uh, were very important to build such a museum in India. So, Igor, I always, always enjoyed uh, going in your office at the University of Georgia because you had a number of photos uh, that captured uh, experiences like this in your career. And I remember one, and maybe it was on this trip, I think Prime Minister Desai, and uh, I believe it was uh, Brezhnev and maybe even Gromyko and Kosija walking down the street right. and you're in the middle of the photograph. But. Yeah, it was a very important, you know, visit, you know, in mm -hmm. terms of bilateral trade, in terms of uh, military cooperation and so on. What was Gromyko like? I know we had Dean Rusk on this campus for many years and he uh, uh, would often mention Gromyko and other people from Soviet history. What was it like being around people like uh, Gromyko? You know, he was a very tough person. He had a long career working in the United States at the embassy. He knew uh, English very well, but he always preferred to have uh, uh, an interpreter, you know, at each meeting because interpreters were supposed to develop transcripts of this meeting based on the notes that they take during uh, this meeting. And he is, was very meticulous about the choice of words. So uh, he often uh, intervened, corrected the interpreter when he didn't like the choice of words. And suddenly the choice of words, it's, it's a matter of person's, you know, background, culture, understanding of the situation. Uh, so very often, you know, you uh, left his office feeling a little bit frustrated. Mm -hmm. So uh, it was quite different with other people, you know, at the Soviet leadership. None of them really knew English uh, and uh, you can really improvise freely. Mm -hmm. I remember your uh, telling me a, a bit about your first meeting with Gorbachev that you recognized right away that he was a different mm -hmm. kind of leader. Uh, can you tell us a, a bit about that initial encounter and some of your experiences? I think it was December 84, uh, and that was the first visit by Gorbachev, who was just uh, a member of the Politburo, the ruling group, but not the top leader yet. Uh, his uh, predecessor, uh, Mr. Chernenko, was general secretary uh, of the Communist Party at that time. Uh, we had a couple of meetings, you know, with Gorbachev before this whole delegation of deputies of the Supreme Soviet, the Soviet Parliament, went uh, to London. But it was his first visit to the West, uh, to the Europe, to Europe. Uh, prior to that, he was in Canada, but as to Europe, that was his first visit, and certainly meeting Margaret Thatcher. Uh, was uh, a really major event in world uh, politics. He uh, 
talk to the group and I immediately realized that in terms of his mentality, in terms of his background and education, he was very different from all other Soviet leaders, you know, I had dealt with in the past. Um, and I was lucky to be part of the group and to attend what is now called the uh, lunch at Checkers when, uh, you know, Gorbachev met Margaret Thatcher and the next day she called Ronald Reagan and said, Ronnie, you need to deal with that person. So I was a little bit proud that I was at the very beginning of the melting process of the Cold War and because a year later, you know, uh, Gorbachev and Reagan met in Geneva and the whole process of uh, nuclear disarmament was initiated and uh, moved along. But then uh, maybe three, four years later, I got a call from BBC. They wanted to interview me about that particular meeting. Uh, I was interviewed, forgot about it, and then they sent me uh, the recording of that, uh, the whole uh, program, you know, on the launch at Checkers. Uh, and there were other people interviewed uh, who participated from the UK. And I realized that the whole visit was very well orchestrated. And the purpose was to isolate all these members of the delegation from Gorbachev so that to give a chance to Margaret Thatcher to stay face to face with Gorbachev at least for one hour. And one hour was enough for her to develop a very favorable image of Gorbachev as a future Soviet leader. Well, he was uh, certainly uh, a new leader and uh, we've all read a lot about him. I just finished a wonderful biography by William Taubman uh, about Gorbachev's life. I remember other stories that you have. In fact, in your office, you had a photograph of you with Gorbachev and his wife, Raiza, looking, I think, in the British Museum at some, mm -hmm. is that correct? Mm -hmm. Can you that tell? That was part of that trip, you know. Ah. It was, uh, I think it was a week-long uh, stay in, in London and then uh, shot a brief uh, uh, trip uh, to Scotland. But the overall length of that was about a week. So we went to a couple of museums, you know, to art exhibitions. Um, there were a couple of, oh yeah, we also uh, uh, went to the British Parliament and he was uh, invited to make a, a presentation before all members. Uh, uh, I think it was, it was a joint meeting of both chambers, you know. I mean, <clears throat> to listen to his statement. And I just, <clears throat> maybe coming back, you know, to the uh, preparation of that visit. Uh, we at the Minister of Foreign Affairs were used to develop uh, in writing all the presentations and toasts, you know, and, and, and anything, you know, that Soviet leaders were supposed to say while traveling uh, in the West. Uh, uh, and there was even uh, a, a joke about uh, Brezhnev, you know, who pulled out a piece of paper, opened it and said, yes, please come in and put it back. <laughs> <laughs> so everything was very well orchestrated. <laughs> so we developed all the toasts uh, and major speeches for Gorbachev, and he never used a single one except the one at the parliament with specific, uh, you know, ideas about possible uh, directions of nuclear disarmament. Mm. So uh, he was very innovative leader. He liked to improvise. He let his uh, imagination sometimes really run wild, which was the main reason of his problem later on. Mm. Mm -hmm because running such a complicated country, you know, as the Soviet Union, you cannot improvise, you know, you have to 
really be guided, you know, by collective wisdom and uh, very careful analysis and everything else. And, you know, rushing from one option to another uh, would be a disaster. Igor, I know you and you mentioned uh, the issue of uh, disarmament and nuclear affairs uh, have had a lot of experience that we're going to get into later. But uh, uh, when did you develop your interest and begin to develop your expertise in this area uh, and your involvement in U.S. Soviet uh, nuclear and other chemical weapons discussions? Uh, as I said, I was employed originally by the Minister of Foreign Affairs uh, as an interpreter. And uh, after this bilateral process of uh, uh, arms control started developing, certainly there were a series of meetings in Geneva and in Vienna between teams from the Soviet Union and the United States to negotiate possible deals uh, and to determine the outline of possible uh, agreements. Uh, so I was assigned to the um, um, negotiations to develop uh, what is now called the INF agreement. So now with ongoing rumors that uh, you know the death of this treaty is almost uh, assured, you know, given uh, disappointment with the performance by the S Russia, by Russia, and also new technological breakthroughs, which make this agreement a little bit uh, obsolete. Uh, I feel a little bit upset because I was involved mm. in these negotiations, you know, in Geneva. And uh, when I graduated from PhD uh, school at the Diplomatic Academy and was assigned to the U.S. desk. Uh, I was, uh, my main uh, uh, function was really to follow the progress of all these negotiations, being in Moscow, manning the store. Uh, several years later, I was, uh, uh, I, I got assignment to go to Washington, D.C. as first secretary of the political and military section of the embassy, uh, also dealing with all, with a wide range of disarmament issues, bilateral and uh, multilateral uh, issues. And that was the beginning of my uh, transition, you know, from being an interpreter to being a, a real diplomat with good experience uh, in, in arms control. So when in 87, the INF Treaty was signed uh, in December 87, uh, the ambassador asked me to take care of this INF agreement on the Soviet side and be uh, uh, <clears throat> a contact person at the embassy with the Department of State and other U.S. agencies uh, regarding the establishment of the inspection activity uh, in the United States. So it was a almost full-time job because uh, when the treaty came into force, uh, teams of inspectors came from Moscow, teams of inspectors, you know, went to uh, <clears throat> the Soviet Union uh, and uh, I was really in charge of that. And certainly the first trip uh, that we had in February 88, the treaty is, was not yet ratified. So it was kind of an informal trip by three persons, you know, from the embassy, uh, including myself, to Salt Lake City, the site where uh, Pershing to missiles were manufactured. And we were supposed really to see uh, from a distance the facility uh, and understand, you know, how we can really put together the inspection activity. It was a kind of revolutionary arms control agreement because inspectors were supposed to stay around the manufacturing facility uh, 24 hours a day. 
and do not and not let anything that would resemble stages of the missile size of Pershing II or longer get out of that facility. It was a very innovative, you know, approach. Uh, verification technologies were improved, uh, uh, and I was involved until my resignation from the uh, embassy in '92 and moving to join you, Gary, mm -hmm. uh, at the University of, of Georgia. Uh, there was a very certainly there were some funny, you know, uh, events, you know, involving my role in putting together all this inspection activity. We were to find a contractor who could bring uh, poor inspectors walking around the perimeter 24 hours a day, uh, food, you know, meals, you know, maybe uh, find accommodation, you know, uh, for them. But it was done uh, in a really spirit of goodwill. Mm. We had a lot of good cooperation from the uh, Department of <coughs> Defense, in particular General LaJoy, who was the head of the verification uh, activity associated with the most uh, uh, Soviet and American uh, arms control uh, agreements. Uh, I met them, you know, after I resigned, after I moved to the University of uh, uh, Georgia. We were good friends and uh, I really appreciate it, you know, this kind of relationship with uh, U.S. officials. Igor, you mentioned coming to Georgia. Uh, I might just say for the uh, knowledge of our viewers that in 1987, here in Athens, uh, we created uh, a new center to look into these relations. We first called it the Center for East-West Trade Policy, and Subsequent uh, years, it uh, was renamed the Center for International Trade and Security. I remember it was probably 1988 or 89, I traveled over to Davidson College in North Carolina, where they were having a conference on Gorbachev's mm -hmm. uh, uh, Soviet Union. And uh, I was fascinated by a lecture, uh, rather, not a lecture, but a debate that was uh, offered between you, a representative of the Soviet embassy, and the U.S. State Department. Uh, do you recall that conference and our, our meeting um, there in uh, Davidson, North Carolina? Yeah, I recall that conference particularly there was a torrential rain, <laughs> you know, on that day. I got lost a couple of times before finding this big city of Athens, you know. Uh, no, uh, Davidson, North Carolina. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. I'm sorry. I'm, I'm a bit confused. Uh, yes, yes, I remember that. And uh, uh, later my daughter, you know, uh, got enrolled at Davidson College, and mm -hmm. I think that was uh, uh, part of the perks of being involved, you know, in that major conference. I remember the debate, uh, and uh, again, at the embassy, in addition to supervising arms control agreements, I was asked also to uh, manage invitations for, from universities and other institutions throughout the United States for embassy personnel to go and participate in their events. So uh, I traveled a lot. I participated in uh, uh, many major events, uh, Texas A&M and maybe other universities uh, as far as West Coast. Uh, uh, and that really gave me a kind of you know, skill you know, to engage people, to talk, to discuss. Certainly my uh, in background as an interpreter and knowledge of English was very helpful really to communicate with my uh, counterparts. So my trip to Davidson was one of those yeah. trips. And that was really a result of very uh, fertile uh, 
soil, you know, that was built during the Gorbachev era to communicate between the two countries, to communicate between officials, uh, and uh, unfortunately, it's gone. It's no longer observed. And I think we are moving back to the Cold War as of now. Yes, that's a, a serious development that I hope we can return to later. I too remember your debate, and so I went up afterwards and introduced myself, and we sat down and talked a little bit because uh, we were developing programs at the university, the new center. Also, we had a long tradition at the University of Georgia called alumni centers that we had here on our campus at the Center for Continuing Education. And uh, I was involved in planning the next one and decided to invite you to be one of the speakers at the, uh, uh, the next seminar. And uh, as I recall, you and your daughter drove down uh, to Athens and participated in this, uh, in this seminar. And again, we were impressed uh, with uh, the way you spoke, your experience, the way you conducted yourself. And uh, we decided to make an offer uh, for you to join us at the mm -hmm. University of Georgia. Uh, that was at the time that the Soviet Union was unraveling. Uh, and uh, I think at the end of your career in Washington, it changed from the Soviet embassy to the Russian embassy. And uh, then uh, you got an offer from the University of Georgia. What was your thinking about uh, uh, your future, your family's future, and your coming to the University of Georgia in the 19, early 1990s? You know, there are three reasons, you know, why I really accepted that offer and I was looking forward to um, move ahead. You know, my, my principle is that, that uh, any person should change his work environment at least once in 10, 12 years. That would give this person, you know, a chance to see other, uh, you know, possible opportunities for developing his personality, developing uh, his or her talents, uh, and, 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 and so on. So I thought time has come for me to drop the uh, diplomatic career, which had its own straight jackets, you know, what to say, what to write about, and, and, and obtain, you know, a freedom to write what you really want to write uh, about, or to be engaged in topics that you believe are important to you, uh, you know, to your potential to become really a good contributor, you know, to uh, research and uh, to maybe teaching. So uh, that was the main uh, reason and I thought that uh, joining a U.S. university would give me really a good opportunity to write what I really want to to write about. Uh, I was quite happy to be a diplomat but again I, I said that we need to move from the straight jacket to a uh, you know, wide field, you know, where you can really find your own uh, options. Uh, the uh, second reason is that my daughter Katya, and you mentioned her, uh, was a, a student, was about to become a student of Davidson College. Uh, and uh, my wife said, oh no, I cannot abandon her, you know, she is too immature, I need to be close. So the choice of University of Georgia, which is located just within what three, four hours, you know, from Davidson, was exactly uh, a good answer, you know, to my wife's uh, concern. And uh, the third reason was that uh, you rightly said there was a, a really transition from the Soviet embassy, from the Soviet Ministry of Foreign Affairs to the Russian embassy and Russian Ministry of Foreign Affairs. I wasn't quite sure about continuation of my career as a diplomat because uh, in the past there were two ministries, even when the Soviet Union existed, 
the Russian Ministry of Foreign Affairs and the Soviet Ministry of Foreign Affairs. And the relationship between the two were not very cordial, <laughs> mm -hmm. to say the least. So uh, there was some kind of selection, you know, who would be recruited, you mm -hmm. know, to the Russian Ministry of Foreign Affairs, who will not be recruited for some reasons. So there was some kind of risk. Mm -hmm. So these three uh, considerations combined, personal, professional, uh, and uh, more academic, because I have PhD and I was really looking forward to continue my career, you know, as a researcher, as a writer, as a contributor to books uh, and uh, to journals, uh, prevailed. Well, I know some of your colleagues from that time went on to become Russian foreign minister, ambassadors to the United States, and and uh, other things. You came to the University of Georgia and helped us very much as our program at the Center for International Trade and Security began to work with American leaders like Sam Nunn and Richard Luger and uh, Russian leaders to try to deal with the growing threat of proliferation of advanced weapons and particularly nuclear weapons. As you well know uh, and our listeners that uh, when the Soviet Union uh, dissolved, there were nuclear weapons that were placed in different now new states of, like Ukraine and Kazakhstan and Belarus. And so a lot of work had to be done to ensure that there was communication and understanding. And uh, I, I, I'm pleased to say that you and I were deeply involved in that and you and I traveled to Moscow and to Washington many times. Uh, I remember one meeting that, uh, and I'd like your recollection of it to see if it corresponds with mine, but we got a call from Senator Sam Nunn, and he said, uh, Richard Luger, a Republican senator, and I are thinking about some new ways of working with Russia and other states to reduce the threat of uh, nuclear proliferation. And uh, you and I traveled to Washington to his office in the Russell Senate building where we sat down around the big uh, round table that I think was formerly used by Senator Richard Russell. And it's interesting today we're in the Richard Russell mm -hmm. Library uh, conducting this uh, interview and conversation. Um, do you recall our visit to, uh, with Senator Nunn and uh, some of the work that we began at that point? and certainly the very noteworthy program called the Nunn-Luger program that was developed in those years. Uh, let me offer a couple of new comments which are not directly related you know, to what you're asking, but I will certainly address that uh, a little later. You know, when the Soviet Union uh, disintegrated, it was really a disaster. Uh, Strategic uh, nuclear weapons were properly uh, protected, at least on the territory of what became Russia. Uh, there was good agreement with uh, Belarus and Kazakhstan regarding these uh, uh, facilities. With Ukraine, it was a little bit different because there were some politicians ambitious to turn Ukraine into a nuclear weapons state. Finally, it was all dissolved. But the worst part was tactical nuclear weapons because tactical nuclear weapons were assigned to uh, small units, you know, around the periphery uh, of the Soviet Union. And when, uh, you know, uh, for example, republics in the South became independent, there was a concern that you know, these technical nuclear weapons can fall into the hands of, uh, I don't know, uh, wrong, uh, wrong military, you know, people who are not able to handle or pass it over, you know, with other countries with more malicious, you know, intent. Uh, so they were evacuated immediately, you know, later in uh, '92 from all these republics to the territory of, of Russia. But there was very little order around 
the railway systems uh, and uh, as trains passed by. So I participated uh, in a very top level negotiations in the summer of 92 about getting what we call Kevlar blankets. Because at that time, the uh, US tactical uh, uh, nuclear weapons were equipped with non-explosive conventional explosives. Russia was just, or the Soviet Union was just moving to that. So any shot from outside hitting a tactical nuclear weapon on inside a car could initiate an explosion, a nuclear explosion. Kevlar blankets are bulletproof. So they desperately, I mean, the, the Russian authorities, new Russian authorities, desperately needed them to protect their tactical nuclear weapons as were transported. Another issue was uh, the stockpiles of chemical weapons, about uh, 40 agent tons of chemical weapons which were aging and really needed urgent uh, uh, destruction. So there was a lot of issues that uh, fell under uh, the heading of Sam Dunn and uh, Luger program. And I was, I clearly remember, you know, we came to Sam Dunn's office and uh, uh, discussed possible options, possible ways, you know, how to engage uh, you know, Russian officials in a more efficient uh, program to get rid of all this legacy of, of the Cold War. And that really built a bridge for me to a new uh, area that I was very much interested in and still doing it almost full time. Uh, I initiated, Gary, with you, work with the export control. And uh, <laughs> I remember in 93, we had a meeting in Washington, D.C., inviting uh, new officials from all newly independent Soviet states to come to that meeting and discuss how to develop their own indigenous export control systems. Because in the Soviet Union, everything was managed and handled from the center, from Moscow. Now they have this authority, they have this responsibility, but you know, the level of education of all these people or their backgrounds were not enough really to be responsible handlers. So of all of these new process. states. I was approached by one person, I wouldn't say which republic, and he asked me, Igor, you know, I was invited to come but I don't understand, you know, what we are planning to do. What is expert control? <laughs> they simply did not even understand, yeah. you know, what export control and non-proliferation was. Yeah. So it took Gary, you, uh, our center, myself, several years really to promote better knowledge of export control uh, train people, invite them to come to Athens, stay with us a week, two weeks, and then work with them, uh, develop joint uh, projects, uh, and, and so on. So it really lasted maybe until the end of the 90s. Right. And Russia was quite well equipped because they inherited much of the former bureaucracy and expertise and personnel to control their nuclear weapons yes. and exports of strategic materials, nuclear materials, and so forth. But we and uh, uh, the world was worried what might happen in other states from uh, Kazakhstan to uh, Ukraine to Belarus, uh, Turkmenistan, and all of the new so-called independent states of the Soviet Union mm -hmm. who lacked uh, the the personnel and the institutions and the experience of controlling these things. And this was a very challenging time for these countries as they tried to, and I too remember that conference that we had outside of Washington, where with the support of the US government and other foundations, we brought together all of the new personnel of these states. And uh, as you noted, uh, 
many of them had no experience. Mm -hmm. And uh, this was, uh, as I look back, a very important period for these countries, the United States and others, to begin to work together to understand how we could uh, cooperate in controlling the what Sam Nunn uh, referred to could have been the largest proliferation of nuclear and other uh, weapons of mass destruction in human history. And you know, as we look back upon that period and what's happened today, this has been a real success of all of the countries involved. There has not been the largest proliferation of this very dangerous weaponry that might easily have happened uh, in the 1990s. And uh, to be part of that, and uh, let me say, working with you, Igor, and uh, the US government, the Russian government, uh, and other governments uh, was a very uh, rewarding period of my professional life. And I thank you for your leadership because you made a real contribution coming to the U University of Georgia and being able to work with people in Washington, I know in the Department of Defense. In fact, you and I had adjoining offices. And I remember uh, uh, all of the telephone calls that you got uh, because you and we at the University of Georgia mm -hmm. uh, played a, a very important, if I may say so, role in, um, in this work. And I must identify that we were lucky to have a very talented group of graduate students. Mm -hmm. And I see all of them have very spectacular careers, you know, upon graduation, you know, from the master program at, at UGA. And, and the really contributed a lot, you know. They developed a methodology to evaluate expert control systems in individual uh, countries. And that was later used by the Department of Commerce. Uh, we established good uh, contacts, you know, in Azerbaijan, uh, in Belarus, in Ukraine, and we raised money to establish small centers for export control involving the public, involving non-government people, you know, who may be interested in uh, really pursuing these objectives. So, I think it's, it, was, it was a very versatile and, um, I would say, intellectually rewarding activity. Uh, yes, it was, and I'm pleased you mentioned those graduate students and, uh, and undergraduates that we got involved in this work who, over the last 25, uh, 30 years, have become leaders, and not only leaders in the United States, but our work in uh, these new independent states we began to work with leaders there who've gone mm -hmm. on to become uh, uh, leaders. In fact, I, I recognize now that the Russian ambassador to the United States is somebody that you and I worked with when he was much younger <laughs> and, uh, and learning uh, uh, this area of uh, str mm -hmm. strategic uh, relations. Yeah, uh, Ambassador Antonov actually uh, was the head of the uh, arms control division, you know, in the Ministry of Foreign Affairs. Uh, cleaning my office, you know, in, in June, I found several communications, you know, from him, you know, ask, I mean, thanking me for hosting some of the uh, employees of his uh, uh, office to come to Athens and working with them on uh, upgrading, you know, their knowledge of expert control systems. Yeah. I think for both of us, one of the rewarding parts of our work together the last 25 years was to see literally thousands of young officials uh, coming from all over the world, frankly, here to uh, Athens, Georgia, to participate in our training programs, uh, our Academy for Strategic Trade Management mm -hmm. Issues. Mm -hmm. And um, uh, that was, uh, very rewarding work indeed. Well, Igor, I also know that you went on to develop a new area of research uh, that related to worldwide nuclear security and developing new concepts like uh, security culture. 
what was the culture in Russia, in uh, Ukraine, or even in the United States and China uh, related to implementing the many rules and regulations and behaviors to make sure that nuclear materials and nuclear weapons were handled in a way that uh, made them safe and secure. Can you tell us a little bit about your thinking back then and how this work evolved where you have become a, a le worldwide leader working with the International Atomic Energy Agency based in Vienna uh, uh, to carry on and promote the interests of worldwide nuclear security. You know, I mentioned that uh, basically the agenda of uh, developing extra control systems in former Soviet republics was completed by the end of the 90s. Uh, but like uh, bolt from the blue, Russia started uh, moving through a period of default in 1998. And that really had a very negative effect on the morale of the uh, people, especially in the nuclear industry. And this was economic default, economic yes, problems. Yes, economic default, financial default. No salaries were paid. Uh, uh, medical institutions were closing down. Uh, there was a lot of unrest, you know, throughout um, um, the uh, different regions, especially industrial regions. Uh, and uh, I got a call from the uh, Department of Energy at some point, and they asked me, you know, as, a, as an expert probably at that time on Russia and Russia, Russia's nuclear industry, what, what, what can we do to really to stimulate people to work with us? Because at that time there was, the bilateral cooperation was not uh, really moving along very effectively. We keep sending, you know, special security equipment, fences, anything that can uh, protect nuclear facilities uh, in uh, Russia more uh, effectively. But, you know, no one wants it, you know. It's still uh, at the railway stations, you know, rusting, gathering dust, you know. How we can stimulate, you know, people to understand that there is a risk. If they don't uh, enhance security, there will be consequences, you know, both for Russia and for the entire world if nuclear material technologies will fall into the hands of uh, uh, terrorists or people with malicious intent. And that really uh, made me start thinking about the role of the human factor, how we can really motivate uh, people, how we can really uh, make them understand that they are performing a very important mission, not only for the country, but for themselves, for their families, for everyone, you know, who live around them, you know, who live around the uh, facility. So we developed a major report, the Nuclear Security Culture, the Case of Russia. This is a report which is still uh, available uh, on the website of NTI. Uh, the NTI, Nuclear Threat Initiative headed by yes, Sam Nunn for right. many decades. They years. funded this report and it was uh, uh, released in Washington, D.C. in 2004. It took us several years, you know, to develop. It's over 100 pages, where we really develop recommendations, you know, what needs to be done to stimulate, uh, you know, Russia and the Russian uh, workforce uh, to understand their responsibilities and perform their uh, roles uh, as, as, as expected. Uh, it was a challenge, and uh, the next year, uh, President Bush and President Putin met in Bratislava, and there was a declaration on bilateral cooperation between the two countries, and to my surprise, I discovered a paragraph from this report in this joint declaration. Wow, I said, 
a small non-governmental center can really influence you know the thinking of of the top leaders of the two great uh, countries so that was a big uh, you know win for us you know with our concept of culture with our concept you know how we can stimulate people and then a couple of months later I got a call from the International Atomic Energy Agency and they said we are developing a uh, a guidance document on nuclear security culture and we want to invite you to participate as one of the international experts uh, in developing based on what you accomplished uh, in your uh, report regarding uh, Russia. So that really changed my uh, orientation as far as uh, research and professional activity. Uh, the guidance document, the implementing uh, uh, guide, was completed and released in uh, 2008. In 2008, about uh, four years after the, the whole work started. Uh, and then I participated in numerous training sessions sponsored by the IEA, International Atomic Energy Agency, uh, in, in many countries to promote this uh, methodology of nuclear security culture, uh, its assessment and uh, enhancement. Uh, and fortunately, you know, I'm still regarded as uh, one of the leading experts, uh, even after uh, my retirement last July, the Department of State asked me to put together a similar workshop uh, in Brazil, and we are now talking about other, you know, workshops, you know, around the world. Um, so that nuclear security culture and uh, different methodologies became really uh, uh, the main agenda, one of the main agendas, you know, of the center. So. As of now, as I understand, we have export control and non-proliferation and security culture as, a, as, a, as another option, you know, for students to learn. And as I was teaching at the um, Master for International Programs, uh, International Policy, uh, I think I paid much attention to the role of the human factor uh, in security. It reminds me, Igor, what uh, contribution universities and centers like the one that uh, we were involved in can contribute to uh, world affairs. Uh, I do believe that the early work in the 1990s on export controls in the former Soviet, uh, the new independent states of the former Soviet Union and then spreading on to other countries throughout the world, which is still carried on. And then also the work in nuclear security culture. And as you mentioned, these require in both fields, methodological developments and careful, rigorous study that uh, often cannot be conducted in government or not conducted in private organizations, but universities have both the uh, the scholars, the training, the, the students who want to get involved mm -hmm. in these programs and can translate this research into uh, products and uh, methods that can be used by the State Department, that can be used by the UN. And as you and I witnessed, uh, the UN went on to play a very important role in making sure that the uh, expanding and proliferating strategic materials and equipments throughout the world were accounted for and controlled in, in programs. And so I want to thank you, Igor. You're one of the people that came to the University of Georgia and made a contribution that drew upon your past experience, your training, and you devoted uh, the most important period of your life to uh, conducting this work that is appreciated uh, 
frankly, throughout the world today. And when I travel uh, to places like the IAEA or to uh, other countries and visit their foreign ministries, departments of state, they often recognize you and the work that was done at the University of Georgia that truly has been, has made uh, the world a, a safer place. Uh, we might move on though uh, from uh, our experiences and uh, the post-Cold War period to uh, the world that we find today. It continues to be a dangerous world and in many respects relations among the, the, the major powers has deteriorated. Uh, the cooperation that we saw and were able to participate in in the 90s uh, has sadly uh, evaporated and uh, the, the, the state of cooperative, constructive international relations on weapons on, of mass destruction, dealing with weapons of mass destruction on disarmament has changed much. Uh, how do you view these uh, recent developments and what needs to be done in the years ahead? I think we are transitioning to a quite new world with multiple power centers. Uh, and I think uh, uh, it's a painful process. It's a painful process. You know, the United States cannot maintain its uh, original dominance. It's not a one polar world, you know. Uh, China, Russia is just uh, regaining, you know, strength. There's a need really to find a methodology, ways to collaborate and cooperate between different power centers. Uh, it will last for many years because, you know, multi-center uh, world will not materialize, you know, overnight. But in order to avoid uh, conflicts and uh, uh, very unpleasant clashes of national interests. We need to understand where we are going. And picking up the, uh, you know, your remark earlier uh, today, I think the strength of the United States is very productive synergies between the academic world and the government. Uh, you know, the open channels, you know, through which academics lend themselves at important government positions. And then uh, former government officials coming back to universities really strengthen you know, our intellectual value. And that would, can really be a good key to finding uh, a good way through the maze uh, of what is going on moving from one single polar world to the multiple, uh, you know, uh, world. So it's a challenge. I don't think anyone can have any specific uh, uh, recipes, but we need to be very, very careful and cautious between what we succeeded in avoiding in the past during the Cold War period will no longer work in our new world. Igor, uh, I uh, agree with you and I also have to ask you, uh, uh, it's a reality that the United States and Russia are the, remain the two nuclear superpowers in the world. Uh, they, uh, during the Cold War, uh, accumulated vast nuclear arsenals they remain today. There have been some successful, meaningful, important uh, efforts at arms control and arms reduction. But the state of uh, U.S.-Russian relations today uh, does not uh, paint an optimistic picture about uh, going forward. Uh, what comments would you make about the importance of the United States and Russia returning to uh, the uh, arms control table. 
Well, as of now, as of today, I'm rather skeptical that there will be any uh, return to the what was established as a appropriate format of arms control negotiations and uh, patents of uh, agreements. Uh, you know, as a person in the past involved in uh, negotiating the INF agreement and also contributing to its efficient implementation both in the Soviet Union and uh, uh, in the United States, I think it should be somehow preserved. You know, withdrawing from all these agreements uh, and uh, finding ourselves in a complete vacuum is not a solution. Uh, I'm, 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 I'm out of, you know, the mainstream of the government thinking, you know, mowing my lawns, you know, and planting flowers. I don't go very often, you know, to Washington, D.C. But what I pick up, you know, from uh, news reports and uh, reviewing, uh, you know, reports from different countries in different uh, languages, uh, I think that there must be a very well-coordinated effort to understand where we are. Uh, and I, I really appreciate the initiative of um, French President Macron, you know, uh, in Paris, uh, on the sidelines of celebrating the 10th anniversary of the end of the First World War, to bring together leaders and experts for the Peace Forum. Uh, I regret that President Trump didn't have time to at least stay one day and contribute to the proceedings of this forum. He's a key person. The United States is the most powerful nation. So I think setting an example, at least demonstrating an interest that we are conceptually trying to um, at least develop an outline of what must be most acceptable, you know, on our transition to the multipolar world would be a very important step forward. Well, Igor, let me uh, thank you for talking with me today. Let me also thank you for your contributions. And uh, let me conclude by asking if there's anything uh, that you would like to add to our conversation today. Are there any points uh, that uh, I missed that you would like to bring to the attention of others? Looking back, Gary, uh, I feel regret that the university did not fully uh, appreciate the contribution of our center to preserving peace, to building up uh, reliable pillars of stable uh, relationship between uh, countries. As I said, our strength is the synergies between academic world and the government. And I think what we did was very useful uh, to show the flag of UGA around the world because uh, UGA become, became a buzzword, you know, for example, in my area of ongoing research on nuclear security culture. I represented the university, and I'm the leading author. I have dozens and dozens of articles and a couple of books on this particular, and they said UGA. So UGA <laughs> is known around the world, you know, as a, a, as a leader in a nuclear security culture. But, you know, at the university, there was, there was very little interest in our research. And unfortunately, some university leaders regarded that it is marginal to the main mission of training students in whatever disciplines they believe are important to them. Igor, thank Sorry you. Sorry for that little bit. No, pessimistic, thank you. you know, no. uh, uh, remark. But I think there was a great potential, had it been supported, had it been encouraged, 
we might have been a great, great world university. Thank you, Igor. It was a, a pleasure talking with you today. Uh, more importantly, it was a pleasure to work with you these many years. And we wish you the very best in your retirement. I hope that you and I can continue to talk about these things. And I hope that the University of Georgia recognizes in the long history of this growing and more distinguished university that there is an important role for people uh, who apply the work that can be done in universities to create a safer and a better world. Thank you, Gary. I'm not giving up. Uh, in two weeks, I'm on my way to Vienna to make a presentation at a major international uh, conference, and I'm planning to continue my research and training as an independent contractor. So I'm on the market. Good. Thank you, Igor. Thank you. Uh, and so am I, and uh, this work will continue. Sure. Thank you.